welcome to Confetti All Around, a podcast supported by Rooted in Reflection. My name is Cynthia Perez, and I am the host of the podcast. And I am so excited to have with us Natalie Gutierrez, a Boricua author and of the really amazing, and we're going to get into this book, The Pain We Carry, Healing from Complex PTSD for People of Color. She's the author of this book. She is a clinician. You have your own private practice, Natalie. And I really... I. I really just am excited to have you here because everything is so timely. I feel like you're really mm-hmm. gifted to this community um, at the right time with this book. So please welcome and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Where where are you from? And um, yeah, welcome. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for having me. I'm really just excited to be here. And I think I know I'm going to introduce myself, but I just want to also say thank you for the work that you are doing for our communities and also the work that you are doing to amplify my work. And, you know, I just feel like it's an honor. So I want to say that publicly because that feels important. Oh, likewise. Um, thank you. Thank you. And I receive, but I, it, it's important. It's important. I, I don't think that, you know, we can do this work without each other. So that's just important to name. And that is the medicine and we are the medicine, right? So just naming that, uh, that feels important to share, you know, and then, uh, and then about me, um, so what do I want to share? You know, I'm I'm yeah. born and raised. <laughs> I'm born and raised in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and I want to say before it's gentrification because where I grew up in the Lower East Side, I grew up in Brook Projects. Um, the projects are still the same, but the area around it is completely different. It's mm. not the LES that I remember. Um. So, you know, there's there's um, some sadness, some grief around that and seeing um, our communities, black and brown, be displaced, even from the lower east side. It brings up a lot. Um, I'm Boricua, like you shared, um, but I, I grew up in New York, in the lower east side, yeah. and, and before my parents separated and then we moved to the Bronx and then I stood there for like several of the years before I started moving around and all that stuff. Um, I've been a licensed marriage and family therapist for, I want to say, I think altogether, well, 10 years licensed in private practice at 15 years in total of practicing. Yeah. Um, and I, and I have my focus and my passion has always been, how do we help? How do I help our communities heal? And I know that's not possible single-handedly, right? I'm no savior. <laughs> And also, how do I do my part in shedding light and awareness on the pain that our communities carry, especially when it comes to the mental health field, when so many of us go into the mental health field and are pathologized, um, you know, are, are labeled, oh, this person just has anxiety or this person just has depression or this person has, you know, whatever, um, you know, bipolar, borderline, and, and, you're, and you're, you're labeled these these things and and not that they're necessarily bad things, but they don't tell the full story. And it feels like, you know, um, my critique is about my field has always been, there is just, there is just always, um, a wish to want to pathologize us without really understanding the why and really treat the individual, but not really understanding the pain that the individual is carrying because they've internalized it from the larger culture. And then also um, they've internalized it or have inherited it from their families, which their families have also inherited it from historical trauma and also from larger cultural burdens. And so all of this is a perfect storm for the trauma that lives within us. And how can we then begin to see ourselves in a more compassionate lens rather than, you know, blaming ourselves rather rather than say, you know, there's something wrong with me or I'm broken, that we really see that so much of what we're holding, so much of that anxiety that we're holding, so much of that depression that we're experiencing is really all interconnected or connected with larger systems and connected with, again, the stuff passed down generationally that is connected to 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 deeper things that are 
beyond us, but we are blaming ourselves for it. And then the systems are also blaming us for it too, including the mental health field. So in a nutshell, <laughs> that has it. been really just my, my life, my soul work, my, my, what feels, I'm just, I'm just entirely passionate about it because I really, I really want our communities to heal. I love us so much and I want to see us healing. I want to see us healing. Healing isn't just for white bodies. Healing isn't just for white people. Healing is for us. Natalie, you are coming in strong with the <laughs> with the spirit. Like I feel really emotional right now because um, it's funny you talk about your childhood in the beginning. And then as you go through, I'm just like, that was so beautiful. And this is exactly why your book, you know, I love that you say, I'm just so passionate about it. And I feel it in the book. And it's like, just like, for real, like therapist to therapist, you know, it's, it's so helpful on a, a work level to be able to have a manual to like do more than just say, I know, I know mm -hmm. that you're facing deportation or separation. I know that you're worried about your mom and este país. I know to be able to give more as a tool. I mean, I mean, it means so much for my work to really like be able to sink our teeth into something as a clinician mm. and feel empowered and feel like heard and seen. But then um, as a person, as a little Nina, as a mother, um, your book has, has changed my life. Um, and I really feel like it's made a ripple effect with other lives. And that's what I meant to do, you know? And so you, I'm sorry, Natalie, your book has um, Why are you apologizing? really helped me. <laughs> it's just that you're here and I'm like, <laughs> I just realized like you helped me unpack what I've been carrying and it's helped me. It's, it's like, for me, it's been my career. It's been something that's like, I'm not, I'm not crazy. I'm not making this up. And to be able to EBT, like EBP it, you know, like this is, look at this book, put this on the, on the work cited, you know, and there's been so many books this year that have done that for me, but your book, like, as a as a woman and a and a Latina daughter, I just um, I was telling you before, like um I read this book, um, it didn't start with you, and I love that book. I definitely recommend that book, but there was something that this book wasn't doing for me, you know. And it has a lot of great resources. And then I found my grandmother's hands and another great book where mm. I was like, yes, yes, getting to the racial trauma and the injustices. And when I read your book, The Pain We Carry, it's just I have this image of myself um, that I always thought like, I don't want to be like this from my mother. I don't want to be like this. I used to think, wow, my mother's so weak. Why, why is she so weak? How can I honor this if it's weakness? And your book talking about the inner protectors and the legacy burdens and um, seeing our epigenetics, the other side of it, the intersectionality of like, yes, these are your stories, but let's look within Let's look at what your parents were facing, your grandparents, what systems were oppressing them. They passed the shame down to you, but what was being forced onto them? And if they rushed you, how much were they being rushed themselves? And so it, you really gave us a lens to like start loving ourselves and loving our, mm -hmm. our own legacies. And that is the healing. And the other part I just want to say is... Um, I do telehealth three days a week. And sometimes it's like demasiado pesado, the things, the stories mm -hmm. that we hold for, for each other, you know? And I just, the biggest thing is you said, like, we deserve to heal. And I just think that there's so many Latinos, uh, black and brown communities that feel like healing isn't going to happen for us. We can't even like soften to the idea of what that might feel like to let our defenses down. And I love that we have a space in these pages to not only have language to it, like I love the words and I want to get into that, but like the language, but also that we matter enough. Mm. We matter enough to get our own book, you know, like mm. you have um, visualizations in this, you have your, your, um, your website has guided visualizations that people can download and listen to your voice and, I, I put my kids to meditation to sleep and I never had that. I had gritos and, mm, mm. and arguments. And so to have mm, you mm. in your guided visualizations, like sometimes I just think I can't believe I'm in this time of this field where it's transforming. So I just want to say like, I didn't mean to break the, <laughs> this is the first time I felt like that, but 
you have you have really come in a time that I think is needed for mental health, but also for us as as the next generation. So I thank you. Mm. I really do. Mm. And I, th- I really, I thank you, Cynthia, and I appreciate you being vulnerable because that just means so much to me. And, you know, even if this, if this book helps you and it, and it, and it, and it has moved you in so many ways, that just feels to me like my work here is done because that, that's exactly what, this is what I wanted. I just wanted I didn't write this book to be famous, right? I didn't, I didn't write this book to, I, I wrote this book because I'm tired of us being forgotten in books. I'm tired of, you know, I, I like in, in school, like in grad school, in um, just in all the psychology textbooks, like it feels like I'm reading again and again and again. And I'm like, well, what about this? And what about this? And this doesn't really land well because this is not, you know, this, this is, this is not including like, of course, this person is going to feel super anxious when, when they're struggling to put money on the table and they are struggling to feed their family. Of course, they're going to feel anxious and depressed and have so much grief and are rageful when their family is being deported. Of course. Of course, that makes so much sense to me. So why are we then pathologizing folks? Why are we then looking at folks? I, you know, I hate even, um, during the, the uprisings, right? After, after all the murders of black bodies, why is it that folks are always judging people for how, for how we speak up? It's never good enough. And, so there's so much just pathologizing of black and brown and indigenous bodies and just all, you know, folks of the global majority. There's so much pathologizing. There's just so much, there's so little compassion that for mm-hmm. that. And, and, and one thing I wrote in the book, I forgot what was happening. Oh, so much, so much shit has happened from 2020. Right, right. To, um, <laughs> You know, but even just noticing how, how in the media, refugees that are black and brown are portrayed compared to um, refugees that are white are portrayed. There is so much more compassion for white refugees than there are for black and brown refugees. There is just so much pathologizing. There's so little compassion and it's just so tiring. So I, so so I just got tired and, and I've been tired for a really long time. I, yeah. I just don't read, I don't read psych books like that anymore. Um, I think, I mean, I publicly said, you know, not to knock the body keeps the score, but I just don't read it. It's just not, I've never read it. I've learned about it. I've learned about some of the material from, you know, other therapists that have distilled it, but I just, I just feel like, ugh, you know, like I, I'm just tired. So Right. I love it. No, I get it. No, I get it. And I actually, I want to keep going on this. I'm going to scrap the questions because I'm so happy to like just flow. But what really got to me was that you hit on epigenetics through this lens. And I want to get into kind of how you're saying like the the legacy burdens, what I saw within my own, what was happening in, in my own kind of pathologizing of what happened to me or what happened to this disconnection with my own mother or my father, you know, um, is this epigenetics that you kind of bring up, uh, within us, like tapping into that ancestral resource, but also the legacy burdens. And I kind of want to explain a little bit of what I mean is, um, when I see pictures of children, we live in California, so we're not that far from San Diego, from the border. Um, and California is considered a sanctuary state, thank goodness. But, there's children's camps that will be here sometimes from uh, unaccompanied minors. And when they say like they're moving them here to the convention center, my heart, like I feel this like gut wrenching thing all weekend. Like, Mm. should I be closer to them? Is there something I've even like, I I've actually not volunteered to do work because I feel like it's too much, but there was always this like gut wrenching kind of whenever I see a picture of the kids in camps, anything of these atrocities are always pulling at me, but there was something about these kids in camps, obviously. And then when I started to think about 
legacy burdens or the epigenetics of my mom feeling that separation as her own childhood. We have our own burdens of immigration where I would be separated from my mom or she was separated from her parents. So I almost felt like when I see these things, it taps into this like deep generational pain and I couldn't put my finger on it. I was like, why do I feel sick? Like it has nothing to do with me. And then I read your book and I was like, when I see those pictures, my protectors, like I have goosebumps talking about it now. Mm. So those are the kind of things I kind of want to be. I love that you put language into the stories that specifically, you know, so that is kind of what I want to ask you too. like you, you show what it looks like and why it might be like that. And you really humanize these people as mothers, as children, as people that wanted connection and attachment and through intersectionality of systems and injustices, they're not able to have that. So now you're seeing the product of generations of this and the pain that we carry. And I, I love the book because we carry so much. So I really wanted to ask you too, for, for people who maybe haven't read the book or have gotten some pieces of it, can you explain um, legacy burdens and legacy resiliency or le legacy resources or ancestral burdens and ancestral resourcing. So stuff like that. Could you explain that for me in your, from your book? Yeah. So I think I want to start off by saying that the, the language itself, cultural burdens, legacy burdens, and personal burdens, um, the language itself, I have learned from internal family systems that talks okay. about those legacy burdens. Um, and has, you know, the, has coined the, you know, legacy burdens, but the idea and understanding is something that we all know from a very soul level because it's a lived experience and we can, we know that, right? Um, so, so cultural burdens, you know, are the isms that, that live within the larger cultural, um, well, I'll just say the larger culture, the larger culture, the system, the systems, right? Um, the laws that govern us, all of that stuff, the the construct of even the racial construct, right? And how all that came about, the um, gender binary, all of this stuff. This is all cultural burdens, all systemic, and all the isms, like social all norms, all the isms, right? Yeah. Right, 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 right. The expectations of of what how we should show up in these spaces in the ideological, country that we're in. Got you. Beautiful. Right. Okay. Ideological oppression, right. Ideological oppression, all of that. Like that is where, that's where the, the dominant group and marginalization begins to happen. Right. And then there is the legacy burden piece, which is the family legacy burden stuff. That's the, the generational piece. That is what we inherit. And that can be colorism that we inherit. Um, you do a lot of workshops on Marianismo and Machismo, right? That is part of like the dynamics that we learn from intergenerational trauma um, or from family legacy burdens, the legacy of perfectionism, the legacy of needing to be strong, don't cry, right? I shared colorism, um, the gender binary, obviously, you know, homophobia, transphobia, that you can see how that will trickle down from the larger culture, right? And, and All of it, yeah. how our families absorb that, right? Um, assimilation. All of these, when you're saying all these, my body's feeling it, Natalie. How about also, for one, I hear a lot is we don't, like, struggle is just what we do. That's our yes. legacy. Like, we're supposed to struggle. We're supposed right. to sacrifice. That is the right thing for us to do. Is that a right. legacy burden? For sure. It is absolutely a legacy burden. In the same way, the inability to rest or to see rest as lazy. Right? So when that can rest, be deeply within us, right? Like, yes, even 100%. if we don't know it, even if we're trying to, that could be unconsciously in us. Right, right. I'm being lazy right now, even though you're really just slowing down and taking care of yourself right there rest like the aversion to rest that we learned from our family right if you ever had a, if you were ever resting and you had a parent or caregiver come in and say me like do something like do something that is you know right there that's that that's that's a legacy burden and where did that legacy burden come from right was it did it come from an ancestral lineage where there was historical trauma 
enslavement, colonization, war, famine, genocide, right? These displacement, all of that. Like, did it come from this? And did it also, or is it also currently being perpetuated by the the larger culture, the the systems in which we exist in, the systems in which we live in, right? And the messages that we internalize from all that. So that that all exists on a legacy burden, uh, you know, within our family, right? And then there's also personal burdens, which is, or which are the things that happen mm. directly to us, lived experiences. So that includes racial trauma, that includes microaggressions, right? That includes um, sexual trauma, that includes intimate partner violence, that includes just all of the, all of the, toxic stress that we have also endured directly that have also impacted us got it our bodies our minds all of that so i see it right right oh yeah it's so heavy i already feel it as you're talking my body's like yep i know that yes i know that and um even i was thinking about the the legacy burden i was talking to another amiga of the the shame i feel if I want to have a friend over, like Natalie, if you wanted to, to, to record here, I want to have you over. And yet I feel the shame if my house isn't immaculately clean. Oh, my oh I can't have God. a friend over. And this isolation that I've caused myself, if I just don't have time to do the dishes. And mm-hmm. it's like, I thought about it and I sat with it. And I was like, you know, this feeling of having to have the house clean for people to show up is a very colonized belief because that's probably what white people told us about us, but they probably had their houses cleaned all the time by people that look like my family cleaning their house. So it's easy for you to be like, house clean. Oh my gosh, how could you? And here we are. Estoy cansada. I don't want to. And I was talking to my friend, like how isolated I've been when I just, I'm, I don't want to have you over because I don't want to put my stuff away. And it's like, what if we could change that legacy burden and be like, Hey, Natalie, I really want to have you over, but can we be in this side? Because I don't feel like cleaning the kitchen today. That is me saying I'm deserving of rest. That That is me saying I honor our connection over yeah. the shame that I feel. And I feel like that's a way to even have our abuelas come have coffee with us and go like, this is okay. And we're like, yeah, it's okay now. You know? Yeah, right. Welcome to my life <laughs> where it's imperfect, right? And that's that's the whole thing. And you know, what you're naming is just, there's a meme that says like, you know, like, Latina families, like what they think will happen when visitors come. And it's like people looking underneath like the, <laughs> like the TV or something. Cause <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and it's that, that is also a legacy burden in the same way that it's also what I see is also tied to perfectionism. It's tied to, we have to somehow feel like we have our shit together all the time. Otherwise, you know, there's something imperfect about us and well, what does that mean if if my house is going to be like messy a lot of the time my house right now is messy <laughs> right. right now my house is messy I am yeah and I and I'm and I'm busy and even if I weren't busy like I, my house does not have to be immaculate that does not say anything about my my value my worthiness yeah. right exactly. it doesn't take anything away from that but we have been conditioned to believe that we have to really present as perfect. And that is such a legacy burden. And I think, I think when it comes to the global majority, when it comes to BIPOC, I think we tend to carry that burden even, that burden is even heavier because there's so much that, that we have been Say taught it. that we need to prove that we carry that even more. We carry that even more. Natalie, so, yeah. Yes, I just want to keep going. Yes, we carry that even more. <laughs> and you're putting language to something where it's like, we can't always talk about these things in all the spaces. And you just know when you can or can't. Um, right now I'm part of like, just before I, I logged in with you, I'm blessed to be part of this telehealth contract, but I, it's all Latinas or Latinos. Actually, there's, there's a male as well. Um, and so it's a group of us and we meet every Friday to consult and we all work with this population of campesinos. And it has been 
I mean, your book is so timely for that work, but every Friday we meet and we have our coffee and we just get to be ourselves, mm. you know, like clinicians, like talking in English and Spanish and just seeing each other. And it has been medicine. I didn't know that I needed or that could even exist because even if I was working in a, in a, a clinic as a Latina therapist, the majority was not Latina. So I would find my one Latina friend, but to have this is such a gift. And I find myself being more myself and loving more myself today. Um, I led and the, I, you know, we always start with an opening and I was like, I don't know what to do, but my thing was, you know, name a woman that you admired as a child and as an adult. And we were like, this is hard. I don't know. And I love that one of my colleagues said, is it bad to say that I love myself? I see myself as an inner ancestor now. And Ooh. she's like, I see myself as, as my future self, you know, mm. caring about me as a young little nieta. And I was, and she was like, is this bad? And I said, no, I think that we were told that we shouldn't trust our yeah. intuition and we shouldn't trust these older ancestors. That's assimilation, right? Like forced assimilation to like what your grandma thought that was stupid. Spanish is bad. You know, you making, you know, making food like that is dumb. And so for us to be tapping into saying, I look up to myself and that also makes me look up to my ancestors. Like I cannot believe as a clinician, I'm having these spaces. Do you have anything to say to those? Ooh, to that? That's just beautiful. That's just that. Oh, that feels to say that you honor yourself, like that you are giving yourself flowers. It's just, that is so deep. That is so deep. I feel like that is, that is part of how we resist, that we honor ourselves, that we see ourselves, that we appreciate and applaud and root for us, right? That, that just feels so important. And I feel like, you know, to that, to that, to that point, even things like, I mean, that can translate into the ways that maybe we play small, right? The ways in which we're like marketing stuff, right? Like there are parts of me even still that, you know, are sometimes I'm like, oh, am I, am I speaking too much about the book? Like, what if people are going to think like I'm stuck up or, you know, whatever. And I have mm. these parts of me and I, and I, and I'm, and I have so much compassion for them because I know that they just internalize a lot of racism, a lot of classism, and they're just afraid, right? Like they're just afraid. They, they don't know any other way but to hide and be small. And so when, when someone says, I want to see myself and I want to honor myself and I, and I honor myself is just so, so powerful because oppressive and racist systems don't want us to honor ourselves. They want us to play small. They want us to stay small so that we can believe that we're small and honor them, not ourselves. So yes. I just love, 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 love that, that there is um, an awakening, that there is um, right? a reconnecting to like really embodying love of self. I feel it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I also think, and even a step further to have the space where we're, we're able to talk about it and feel safe. Mm -hmm. And then for her to share that with other uh, Latino clinicians and for us to hear like, that's okay to do. Yeah, that's okay to do. You know, we're planting seeds. Um, I've actually felt the work I've been doing on myself with intergenerational uh, att and attachment trauma and a large part of it just by like letting myself be held by books like this, be held by words like this, like follow through with the process, tap into that inner knowing. I've seen changes, Natalie. I've seen it with my mom. Um, she has almost like almost been like, what are you doing? You know, like you can't act like that. And I'm like, actually, I can or I have her come over <laughs> And um, you see, you probably see my reels, but like I have fish tanks and I'll see her like restless and I'll be like, mom, go light the altar, like go talk to your mom. And she's like, what? You know, I'm almost like reinventing. I'm bringing up things that she didn't get to do because if she did it at my dad's house, he'd be like, what's that? You know, so I see her over here like restless, restless. And then after a while and she sees my husband like, hi, you know, 
and just totally different from my childhood. And I almost see her like, is this okay to do? And it's like an invitation when we embody resistance with kindness and love. It's like an invitation to elders. It's an invitation to the younger generation. And it's mm -hmm. like a re-giving to myself. It's like really holding space for myself. Speak it, Cynthia. Yes, mm. yes, yes. And, and it's actually, I just thought of this. Yeah, it's modeling. Sorry, you, you mentioned the word and I'm looking for it. Not just legacy burdens, legacy resilience. See, right? Resources. Legacy resources. resources. Yeah. And it's, and it's what you're also naming right there. Like when we think about, um, and what you named before, when we think about the pain, right? The stuff that we have inherited from our ancestors, that we didn't just inherit that. Right, that we also inherited their the ways that they survived. We inherited their resources. We inherited all of that. And so, how do we also embody the gifts? Right. And I think a lot of it is that we're very intuitive. Right. That and and I think just when we feel called to to do something or just called to something, like music, like food, like farming, like just whatever dance, you know, um, or healing in all the ways that we do. I just, I believe that it's, it's our ancestors that are living through us that are reminding us of what, uh, of their own internal resources. And we also have that. So we don't just inherit the stuff that is, that, can, that has hurt us and that has hurt them, but we've in, we inherit the beautiful things. Yes. This is where our work intersects. This is where your book was like, and I, and I, first of all, actually, I want to give a shout out to my amiga. I know she's your amiga, Litera P NYC, Emily Rumble, yes. an amazing clinician. She, she, she specializes in bibliotherapy for black and brown uh, communities. She is like, she is the, the prescription writer for these really great books. And she put me onto mm -hmm. your book. And every time I need a book, She's like, I think you're talking about this one. And then apunto, you know, like I need it. Uh, but um, I, yes, what I loved about this is the intersectionality of the epigenetic power. I, I was like, so what we're saying is like, we've been taught so much um, that we have all of these things, like we have our aces and, you know, mm -hmm. um, we have that, like Latinos, just for example, have a, the highest rate of diabetes. Um, I worked in, in uh, medical social work, black communities, high rate of uh, high blood pressure, right? And so they just talk about our ACEs in such a sad way. And the, the first thing I saw was like, okay, so what are we going to do about it? You know, like, so what are we doing to help our community? Don't just show us, like, what can we do? And I, I sit back at our people and I just think like, we are so creative. Mm -hmm. We are so creative. Um, since I was a kid, I've been fascinated with the legacies of Black people because they're so rich in history and knowledge and creativity. I've always been like, I want a book about that. Mm -hmm. I don't know what all y'all talking about, but I'm going to read this book because I saw something that's like, this is creativity even within oppression. Like, so I was always thinking, so what would happen if they didn't have all that oppression? How much more could they be? And that's the, that's the window of possibility I saw. If we didn't have all this, how much more could we expand? So mm -hmm. what I like to talk about is the epigenetic power is what you're saying is that our epigenetics is this switch within us. I say it, it's like our battery pack. Like when we go to the back of the house and all the switches are off because we've been using too many restlessness, anxiety, you know, stress, mm -hmm. the switches are all haywire. And I go back there and I'm like, I don't know which switch is which, but like my anger, my rage is up, right? Like my, my, I'm not going to let you do this to me. I'm going to be guarded. That switch is up within me. And I realized these are deep switches that are there to protect me. Um, and so I got really sad about it. But then when I was like, wait a minute. How, and I, I remember being really upset and crying about this one day. And then I thought, well, how did my abuelas survive this? How mm. would they survive this pandemic? I mean, because they did, they lived in poverty. Here I am living in, you know, so how would they do it? And that's when I started to go within and go, oh my gosh, if I have their anxiety, it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. I also have their epigenetic power, their resources. Yes. And that has been the world to me, but it was this knowing within me, like when I'm barefoot in my garden and I'm wearing my grandma's type of bata, 
Like I put on, I, I, it's like a knowing Natalie. It's like, I knew what I needed. I would put on the flowery dress and I would like make my cafecito. And one day it just hit me. This is what she would do. You're doing it. You're going to your garden. And I was like, <gasps> and I felt this like healing. And then I saw your book and I was like, you know, so we really have the intersection, but I just love that you're really bringing back because it is the decolonization of what our grandmothers didn't get to live in or our grandfathers. Mm. They didn't get to live in their power that they had. They had to keep it small and inside. And, and we knew that like, you know, my mom can make miracles happen um, some of the time. And so now we're like allowing a greater bandwidth for this joy. So I really love that your book taps into that with this like space for self-compassion for these, for these mm -hmm. um, elders, even if, even if their life was hard, we get to kind of like redo it internally. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm just listening. I, I'm, I'm envisioning the bata and I'm envisioning just being outside in the garden. And it just feels so beautiful. Like I'm just noticing like, a, oh, in my, in my own, um, my own system. And I'm just appreciating even, you know, what you're saying about the A scores, right? Like I remember, I remember um, a bit ago, I, I, you know, was, was talking with my mentor, um, one of my mentors around the A scores. And I, I remember saying, I can't remember the exact conversation, but I, I know the gist was that I was feeling like, oh damn, this person or these people have high A scores. So I feel like they're really fragile. And, and my mentor looked at me and was like, what? Um, and he said, Natalie, they have high A scores. So they're not fragile. They're very resourceful. They are fierce. These people know how to survive because they have been through everything. And that, that shit clicked. And it's not, to, of course, there's tenderness in all of us, right? So that's not knocking the tenderness. But I, you know, it, that really, that perspective meant so much to me because it was like, right, survivors are tender, right? But they are hella resourceful. When you have been through so much, you, you have to know how to get through, when you are put through it, you, you need to know how to get through. And so, and that is channeling the resources of your ancestors without you even knowing, right? And of course, your own internal, your own internal power. But it's all of that is, is leading us through and it's guiding the way. And yeah, I changed my, that instantly just resonated and I've changed my outlook since then. And, <laughs> and that have just you felt, felt so much. Yeah, think have you felt carried through this through we were I didn't want to ask you before cuz I want to know now. I feel like you have to have some kind of ancestral support pushing you. Tell me like how did you go into writing this book especially with your own legacy burdens? How did you push through? What are you using? What's what's supporting you? What are your resources? Um <laughs> I definitely did not write this book by myself. Um, that would just be super impossible. I'm still, I still have, I'm still noticing like, you know, when folks tag me in books or when I even see it and I'm like, that's my name, <laughs> that's my name in this book. And I'm like, I, I am rereading my book because I'm trying to give it to myself as a gift, like as if someone else has written it, because that Ooh. is a book that I never got. So wow. I'm, I'm also rereading it for other parts of me to see it. And this is just my own way of being in relationship with my, my little me's. Right. Um, but I, Cynthia, I feel like a lot of it was really a lot of spiritual discussion inside of me, a lot of ritual, a lot of like being, this is, this is where I'm at right now. I call this my medicine room. This is where I create. This mm -hmm. is where I support and hold. So this is, this is my medicine room. Um, I have my altar here. Um, and so I've spent a lot of time here just crying, just saying like, help me, like help me write this book. If you want me to write this book and if you want me to touch the lives of other people then help me write it i cannot do this by myself and i've really said that multiple times i've said like i i cannot do this by myself so 
please help me. Please help me write this book. And then once I'm done, it's beyond me, right? I've done my part. I've done I my part it. with you tell. in this book. <laughs> and then, then whatever else happens after that is, is beyond me. But I need help to write this. And, and, and that's just what it became. So I, this was a very collaborative effort from spirit, from ancestors, from friends, from my family helping me, from like all the tea and coffee that I drank to help me, you yeah. know, get into the zone and say, and all the tears, you know, like oh, going back into therapy because I was really struggling. Like there was stuff that began also coming up for me, just even around yeah. being seen, right? Own um, um, legacy burdens around being seen. Terror is just terrifying for me. I, I really struggle with being seen. And so, or parts of me really struggle with wow. being seen. And so I, you know, coming into like, what's this going to be when this book is outside in the world and I have to like own it now. I have to own it now. And so the that's, ultimate that's being very, seen that, and being exactly, read. Exactly. <laughs> and having my story yeah. out there and like, how are people going to receive me? And, and when people start leaving bad reviews, and of course the first review that I had was like terrible. <laughs> really? <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> and but you know that was that was learning for me because I had True. to then come to terms with listen after this again I've done my part and like when reviews start coming then that's okay because this book even though I've intended I've had my intentions folks with, with this book not everyone is gonna like this book and that's gonna have to be okay for me and that that's not a reflection of me, right? This can't, I can no longer be attached to this book in that way. This yes. becomes, it's going to be a birth of its own. It's going to be an entity of its own and I have to release it. And so that's, that's what I've done. But I, but it, it was a whole journey. This whole thing has been such a life-changing journey for me and mm. that it's really taught me lessons of how much I cannot do by myself. <laughs> And how much you know community is needed and ancestors are needed but you yeah, really had to let yourself go natalie i see it as right. your resistance to to how many times we're like don't do it who are you to do it and you mm -hmm. really resisted so much to say no i have mm -hmm. a story these stories that need to be told and i imagine you just like every time you think you're gonna fall like an ancestor going nope we got work to be done or yes i'll hold you while you cry but you know, and I could just see it like and just I get so emotional imagining you asking for help because that in itself is resistance that in I mean, is like, you know, radical resistance from the mainstream and saying, actually, I don't know what's going on out here, this noise, but I'm going to I'm asking you for help because I trust you. And then to let yourself I imagine you have to really give so much. And for people, I mean, if you don't know this already to be a Latina Boricua clinician and to be like, I, I'm going to write an expert book and I'm going to do, <laughs> I'm going to show you some meditations. Like we needed that. And I, I thank you. Sorry. You had to be the one and thank you for being the one, right? <laughs> like it's changing your life, but also it's changing lives. And I get so emotional because I can think of a time where I was calling out for help on how I can like, how I can do this. And I felt like that's exactly a really good example of how, you know, you don't have to carry all the pieces as a wise living ancestor. You know, I'm going to do my part. I pick up Natalie's book and I carry it into my group and that's it. That's my role. I don't have to like, cause I, when I sit and think, well, do I have to write a book and do I have mm -hmm. to, I don't really know if I want to write a book like that. I have great books that I can cite. So really just sitting with my purpose and sitting and knowing because um, the therapy I do is really difficult, but knowing, okay, well, Natalie's doing her part. You know, Lidiana's doing her part. My friends are doing their part and that's all we can do. But then confirming right now that you asked for help in this book and I asked for a book for help. Oh, and I got it right. And like, I just want to share with mm. everybody. I know, I mean it. I really, this is super profound. I didn't think I was going to be having these conversations in my career. I didn't think I was going to be making these connections with clients in my career. Um, but, you know, I could just tell from your book that it's rich, that it's spirit led. And I just, yeah. Don't you feel this like magnetism, like this moment happening, Natalie? 
I do. I do. And there are still also noticing parts of me that want to run from it. <laughs> you know, that are still See? talk about it. <laughs> oh my gosh. You too. I really just want to run from it. And then they're like, can you fast forward to where you write a book just about like seashells or something like that? <laughs> cause, cause racism and oppression are gone and everyone is healed and, and you can just write, you know, a like it's, it's that. And then just, again, you know, there are just parts of me that are still like, that are still asking me, like, are, are you sure we're not going to die if we're seeing wow. like that? That's wow. the, that, that is much the fear. Yeah. And I know that it's ancestral. Like I know that it's ancestral. My, Yeah. I know that it's ancestral and I know that part of it is also connected to my own personal bit burdens that I also name, you know, in the book too, around bad things that have happened to me when I was seen. Right. Um, and there is, there is no other way that I can really bring solace to these younger parts of me, unless I put myself out there and show that I'm still okay. Because I can share, I can, I, I speak to them and I'm in relationship with them, but they need to see it to believe it. And the only way that I can do that is really by having these conversations, by connecting with other people and say, you see, I'm still okay. Yes. I'm still okay. And they need to see that to really believe it. It's I'm still okay when this person hates my book. I'm still okay when they leave a bad review. You're still okay. Right. You're still enough, right? You're still Beautiful. here. Beautiful. By the way, just between us two, <laughs> I, I I feel you. The you know I've been talking with a friend of like when you put something out and there's silence or there's a thing, it's so vulnerable for us and it, it can be very triggering of another part. Um, my one of my first uh, reparenting groups, you know, my groups are social justice led, so I talk about that in the beginning and I say that the only two negative critiques I've had were white women. And they were so specific on, I just didn't feel like we should talk about those things. And it felt, first I was like, oh my gosh, like they said this. And then days later I was like, this is my group. And mm. you knew that this is what we talk about. And then days later it was like, wait a minute, why did you choose to comment that? You know, I, I let myself go through these myriad of all the feelings. And it was all those parts of me of like, <gasps> you know, and by the end, I was like, this group maybe wasn't for you then. And maybe because everybody else, women of color that have been in these groups are like, you know, and so really sitting with those parts of me saying, look, this is not always going to be for you. But if I didn't do it, then I would have always just been like, yep, she's right, you know. Um, and then really reconciling that part of me is like, so these two girls don't like it. How mm -hmm. about all of these other women? And how about when I go to bed? Like, I have never felt so fulfilled in this work. Mm. So I remind myself that like, this is a new you. And if people don't like it, yeah. that's a new you too of accepting yeah. that. Ooh. Yes, yes, and yes, 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 and yes. And you know, one thing that feels really important because you mentioned M um, from literacy NYC, right? And it, I want to bring her name back here because it feels important to mm. say out loud that um, one, and I noticed some emotion in me. M gave me a beautiful shout out on, on publication day, October 1st of 2022. And I... There was something about that that felt like it was an invitation without her even knowing. Like, you know, she just, she, she was just saying, congratulations, it's your public, it's, it's, it's your day, right? Your, your book is now launched. It's your release day. And it was, for me, it was like, wow, someone knew. Someone was paying attention and someone, someone was like, welcomed me into the world, welcomed this book into the world and and that just, it was that moment for me. And then, and then, it, and she put like Aguanile was playing in the, <laughs> um, in the background. And I just felt like a rite of passage when she posted that. For me, it was a rite of passage. And I was like, oh, like it, it just felt like such a, a welcoming. It felt like that's right. It's my publication day. 
I get to spread the news about my book to the world. And it was something about that that just gave me permission when I saw her post and that welcoming that just really like really meant so much to me. So that really, and I'm saying that because that, that is exactly the importance of community. And that is exactly the importance of, we don't even realize how we are mattering to other people, but we are right. And so you mentioned like, I don't know that I want to write a book, but maybe my part is doing this, right? That, that, that is exactly it. And Cynthia, you know, you also have been someone that has been very encouraging of me. And I think these things are really important, especially for new authors, right? Like I, I'm not an, uh, an author that has like, you know, a million followers or whatever. Like I, I'm an author that has written this book that's not going to be for everyone that centers people that have been forgotten and we need people cheering us on along the way and you have been that for me and so I just appreciate mm. that M has also been that for me and so many other people and that that is important to me and for me I feel like that is ancestral led that is like ancestors I saying know. we are going to remind you along the way when you are forgetting <laughs> We're going to remind you along the way that this is needed and it was needed and it wasn't done in oh. me. And I really feel that. Oh, girl. Just yes. Yes to all of it. Yes. Um, and we deserve it. We deserve yeah. it. It's our time. You know, I, I feel the same way. And I love that you just said we're going to be reminded. I just want to share a quick story. I was meditating this summer with like, I've had a lot, I've been asking for, this is very vulnerable for me to share, but like, I've been asking for this release of scarcity mindset. Mm. I realized that although my growing up, my parents were immigrants, but they spoke English, even if it was like, mm. they were able to get good jobs. And so I always thought like, well, I'm not poor because we lived in these middle-class white neighborhoods, but my parents were always scarcity. They were like, there's not enough. Like they still were poor in their mm -hmm. mind. So it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. So I find myself in this beautiful house that came to us, you know, the prices dropped. It was after a really horrible racist situation and we had to find a house and everything kind of started working out. And so one day, um, I was just kind of like asking, please, abuelas, like help me get rid of this scarcity mindset help me like alleviate this. How, how, how? And Natalie, I swear to you, I had this knowing of them mm. saying, Mija, we helped you get into this house, remember? Mm. What makes you think we're leaving you now? What makes mm. you think we would leave you after this? We're with you. They had the pensara si. And I saw it. It was like, we helped you then. What do you think? We're just going to leave? And that was my scarcity. <laughs> oh, so that Ooh. was the scarcity within me. Like, I'm alone again. Yes. You know, and they were kind of like reminders that this is where you're supposed to be. And I so so the work I do with with women like you, with people like you is like my calling my and I don't want to say my debt because it's not a burden, mm -hmm. but it's what I get to do. And I get to also be carried because I know that I'm doing good work, you know, and so that's what makes this whole thing worth it. And so. Emily, by the way, she's a good friend. We, I feel like I've met her. I, I, I imagine what her hair smells like. But <laughs> to have amigas that are also clinicians and are taking a risk on themselves, being seen. I know for Emily, she's an introvert. It's hard to be seen. Mm -hmm. But she has cultivated within me this love of myself as a reader. I didn't know I was a reader. But her, her page is so important because she talks yes. about books that are like Medicina. You yep. know, she's the one that told me about my grandmother's hand. She's the one that told me about Brujas by Dr. Mm. Um, Montague. So these things have changed my life. So, yes, I feel like we are all interconnected. And it's really about us being in our joy or our rest enough to receive it and not yes. just go, you know, oh, my house is dirty. You know, I can't tell. I can't re be real with Natalie. It's like, no, be mm. real in these moments. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yes, yes, yes. Oh. 
you. Okay, we. I have a couple more minutes. I want to talk about the other things. I have so many things. We 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 can go on so long, but I really <laughs> wanted to just read something. I think this is a great time from your book, if that's okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. I highlighted this, and it's perfect right now. So, chapter nine, third empowerment step: accessing the mm. energy from your ancestors' wisdom. I love this part, but this page um, one twenty nine. While you may carry the painful legacies of your ancestors' trauma, you also carry their resilience. Your ancestors' energy lives within you, like their DNA, courage, and intuition. Regaining the spirit of your ancestors as you reclaim your healing can help you embody more of your ancestral wisdom. Your ancestors, known and unknown, love you. They've been watching you grow and are rooting for you. The journey the world, they journey the world with you and they can be great guides to turn to and help you with those hard decisions when you're feeling lost. They've carried both legacy burdens and legacy resources. Mm. I know that was spirit led. I know you, I, I picture you just writing like, you know? <laughs> in a trance. Sometimes it's just in a trance. Like I would be here for hours and I'm just like, you just can't stop when it's just when it's just flow. It's just you will do 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 do, and it'll just. And are there writers like, in your family? Is it a are, do you what is in your lineage? Is it storytellers? Some Natalie, tell me May what's up. <laughs> Creative like how <laughs> healers. <coughs> excuse me, healers with hands. My great grandmother in Puerto Rico, in Juana Diaz, is known for healing people with her hands. People used to come and bring family members and she used to pray and she used to do these things and she used to heal people with her hands. And so, um, there are musicians. We are a very, um, musically connected family, but no one writes in that way. So I wonder if my way of using my hands is the right. I, I love, I saw that when you said hands, you're still using your hands and yeah. you're like channeling all of that wisdom and using your hands. It's so beautiful. Okay. So many things. I want to ask you one more question that I want to talk about the retreat. Um, yes, what do you yes. do to tap into your flow? You want to be mm. like, you want to calm yourself. We talk about these, like, I want to picture Natalie when you're like, I need to, Get out all of this. What are you doing to tap into your ancestor, uh, your resources and really tap into that inner abuelita? Mm, crying. <laughs> yes! <laughs> <laughs> crying. Um, crying. And I, and I have noticed when I am the least connected, it's because I haven't cried. I remember when... We first, when the pandemic first started back in March, 2020, I did not cry at all. It was again, legacy burden of not crying. And that was when I also felt the most alone and the most afraid. And that was also at the beginning of writing my book where I was very um, heady about what I was writing and I was intellect intellectualizing and my publisher was actually going to like, they were getting near of, I want to say like trashing my book because it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. And I was just super, I was very disconnected to what I was writing with the reader. And it just all made sense because it was during that time. I wasn't really even connected with ancestors. I was just really in a split, in a space of, I was just lost. I really was just lost and disconnected within myself. And then it wasn't until one day I just started, I just like started sobbing that really then began to change a lot of things for me. And then I, and then, you know, along with a, a talk with my publisher where they, and they reminded me that my voice was really important and that they picked, that they wanted, that they chose me because they appreciated my voice and that they didn't want me to pander to white people, that they wanted to hear my natural voice in writing the book that really shifted. Um, and that's when I was, I started asking for help. Um, from ancestors and um so crying <laughs> so crying definitely definitely I think also it's you know sometimes it's movement it's really depending on what it is that I'm needing sometimes it's movement sometimes it's taking a walk and really a lot of the time it's being in nature somehow which is why you know I want to move back to Puerto Rico because I want to be on my ancestral land and I also want to be around more trees and more nature and I want to garden I want to I want to 
um, create our own, uh, grow our, 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 as, as much food as we can on our own. And that feels like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm channeling more of, of my ancestors, but singing also dancing music is so important for me. That is just how I, if I'm hella pissed, I'm going to put some music that's going to have me like, ah. um, so for sure, music, for sure, singing, crying, walking, um, sometimes it's sleeping <laughs> and yeah, sometimes giving them it's that really, rest. Yeah. And sometimes it's holding my children because it's a reminder of they're the next generations that I'm going to be, you know, ancestors too. Right. And I want to be well for them. I want to be, um, I want to pause and say, cause I also understand that some folks have issues with the word well with ancestors. So I want to, uh, maybe change my language around that and say, um, I just want to be healed for them. I want to be more healed for them. So that's, that's, you know, a very important thing. And of course, offerings for my, my altar, lighting candles, um, smudging, limpias, all of that is also very important. Really just listening to the call of what I'm needing and just engaging with the elements. Thank you. That's so beautiful. I actually want to also ask that, do you find yourself doing things as, uh, you know, when you want to tap into that, that you used to always do as kid, as a kid too? Because I find the relationship between my inner Nina is very similar to how I like to be as this, like how, when I embody my abuelas, it's like pretty similar to what my little inner Nina. And that yep. has really spiritually been like, oh my gosh, I knew it all along. Yeah. And it makes me honor my children more as these like wise spiritual. Have yep. you felt that? Yes. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And you know, as, as I'm also hearing you say that too, one thing that I've also, that I've always done as a kid is when I'm reading or something, I'll do this. I always play with my ear. I always play with my ear and it feels like it's a way of reminding me to listen. Like, I feel like there's something about just touching my ear that it's just been a reminder to listen. It's a soothing, but it also puts me in this trance. So I'm wondering if even that is connected, if even that touch, because it's my ear, it's nowhere else. It's just my ear. Right. So right. I wonder about that, but everything Ew. else, music, dad, everything else is very much how my inner child is soothed. I see it. I love it. Okay. I want to talk about your upcoming retreat. I'm going. I'm going with my I'm friend so Sophia. I'm so excited. I'm excited that you both are coming. Really, Natalie, so excited. We, uh, we are excited. I <laughs> sat with it and I was like, I have to make this happen. I have to. I And I kind of just was like, I know this will work out. I know I can mm. make it happen. But I really mm. had to break out of this scarcity mindset, this guilt of like, is this, am I deserving of this to take this money out of my family kind of bank of this. And I was like, I sat with it for a couple of days and I'm like, yes, this is an investment in myself, in my work, mm. in my healing for my children. And my friend Sophia Tamien, after two days, we're like, we're going to do it. Like, we're going to make it happen. Our ancestors are going to help us, you know, make it happen. And then we put it down. And every day we're like, I'm so glad we did that. So tell us about this retreat. Tell us, like, what are you expecting? What do you want to, like, what do you want to bring to to this group? Tell us about your retreat. Yes. So first, I also want to say that I also, um, in a different way, like the Lidiana and I, as we're, you know, planning this, it's always, I'll speak for myself. I've had, I know um, this is also true for Lidiana, that I've always wanted to do this. And I've always talked myself out of it. Because, you know, imposter, <laughs> imposter yeah. syndrome, um, which, you know, is connected <laughs> to, to not us, but internalized racism and classism and all the, um, all the things, all the things. Um, and so it was kind of like, uh, I'm going to just freaking do it <laughs> kind of moment. And then I said, but I, you know, I want to share this with someone like this is going to be my first time doing a retreat. I have run groups before, but this is a retreat. Um, I know that I want to do it in Puerto Rico. Who do I feel is, is aligned with this and that I can really 
co-create with. And then Lidiana kept, her, you know, her face kept coming to me and I said, she's the one. And then she said, yes. Um, when I asked her if she was, with, if, you know, she was open to it. Um, and I, the purpose of this retreat is one to help women and femmes of color build community so that we can have more of that. I think when we talk about scarcity, there is definitely uh, scarcity when it comes to spaces that are for us, by us. And I have found, we both have found that there's been such a struggle with taking up space, with reclaiming our voice, with also feeling a rupture and disconnection with our own roots and ancestral mm. wisdom. And so how do we help women and femmes of color in community as a group hold this together, right? Grieve together, grieve the loss of this together, and then also create rituals of reconciliation where we can really also begin to release some of the burdens that we've internalized in from, you know, the legacy burdens, the family legacy burdens, and also from the larger culture. How do we also create and engage in ritual that helps us to really release some of that so that we can see ourselves more clearly, so that we can love ourselves and each other more clearly and hold each other and also practice taking up more space. So that's what we're wanting this offering to be. And, and Lydia and I, and I are both so passionate about it. We're so excited. Um, we're hoping to do this. We're hoping that this could be something that's annual. Um, and I, I hope it's okay to share this. I imagine she will yes, call me please. in if it is not also. <laughs> but we're wanting to also do this from an intergenerational piece. So, you know, at some point, wow. what would it be? to bring a family member, a parent, or caregiver, you know, mommy, papi, tia, whoever, and how do we heal even in community in this way, right? So that is, that is the grand goal. Wow. <laughs> Considering even them, yes. You too, you and Lidiana, we thank you as receivers of this offering because, you know, it's so funny to shift to shift the the imposter of like, who am I to do it to, I'm so glad I'm the one doing this. And so I want to say, I'm so glad you two are the ones doing this because if not, other people go and do these retreats and we go to those, but you, you, you have something to offer and we want, we want to be in that. We want time and space. So this feels like just such a beautiful beginning of something. And I just want to congratulate you and, you. and really just, Thank you. And um, I just can't wait to see all the, the beautiful, more fruit of your work. You know, this this book is just the tree, but there's so many fruits that mm. you're offering from it. So thank you. Mm. Thank you. Um, and then thank I want to ask you the biggest question we've got. This is the longest one we've done, but uh, Natalie, I just can't get enough. Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned this a little bit, but how do you want to be remembered as the ancestor you are now living now? How will you hope that later when mm. your grandkids or the community <clears throat> or the people that know you in Puerto Rico and lower Manhattan, the little, how do you want to be remembered as your time on this earth as a living ancestor? What would you hope that people take away from this moment mm. or these, mm. this, your mm. legacy? Yeah. Mm. I hope they remember me as tenacious. I hope they remembered me as someone that was for the people and humble. And I hope they, I hope that they remember, I hope that when they think of love and when they think of tenacity and when they think of ally, when they think of advocate, when they think of really someone that is for the people that they think of me as being mm. a part of it. And also being imperfect, right? Because I, I'm a human and, and I'm I'm a fallible human at that. But that they remember me for wanting to embody, I get a little emotional thinking about this, but just embodying love, really just embodying, um, embodying love and wanting healing for us. Beautiful. I see it as safety. When you say that, like you are a safe person, you are 
this loving, oh, I, beautiful, Natalie. Thank you. So with Thank that, you. I'm sorry to cut this, sh not short, but I, I'm sorry this has come to an end. I had a lot of questions, but Natalie, thank you for just being present. And, you know, I know y'all, I can feel Natalie's just like, I just feel really emotional because I just feel your love. I feel your energy. I feel like the grandness of, of your words when you, when you're here. So I appreciate you so much and let us know. I, I saw just now that you posted a BIPOC book club with your book. Please share where we can find you, where people can sign up, um, and how to how to get in touch with you. Ooh, so Cynthia, thank you so much again for everything, and thank you for having me and just supporting me in all the ways that you do. I just want to say that I appreciate you too, and I don't want to end this without saying that. Thank you, um, my pleasure. <laughs> And, you know, as far as social media is concerned, uh, I am, I think I'm most active on Instagram. Uh, so my social media handle is at Natalie Gutierrez LMFT. I'm also on TikTok, but I'm not really, I know um, too. yeah, it's just, it's a whole other kind of thing. So I'm just, um, you know, I, I post there when I can, but I'm also on TikTok. And then I also have a professional Facebook page, which I'm even less on that. <laughs> So I, know. <laughs> I would say Instagram on Instagram. Okay. I also have a bio for all my offerings, including the book club that you're mentioning, which it might need to, I might need to create three of them. Cause there are, there's a lot of interest. Happening. Yes, Natalie. So, um, so we'll see. I have to think about how that's going to look like, but I'm excited. I'm excited, excited, excited. That's expansive. And yeah. I, I'm so <laughs> happy. <laughs> about that and, and also honored. your your publisher where we could get your book from your publisher because i love that you offer guided visualizations what is that yes. website yes so um they are new harbinger publisher i don't know if it's dot com or dot org but if you okay. google the pain we carry there it is new, new com. got it yes right there so there it goes the pain, if you google the pain we carry new harbinger Dot com. It will take you to the website. And then if you go to, I think it's free tools, you click there and you can download. I think there's about 10 meditations that I re recorded so folks can hear it in my voice. What a beautiful offering. Thank you so much, Natalie Gutierrez. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Cynthia. <sighs> Thank you, everyone. And I hope you love this episode. Feel free to check out more in the show notes. Check out Natalie and let us know your comments or feedback. Did this speak to you? Did you find yourself being pulled by some of our stories or our shares? We would love to hear about it. Thank you so much. <laughs>